A leader has to take the risks. Anything specifically you think would bring a lot of value to your audience or? No, man, I just, you know, we're going to shoot the shit and, you know, we're going to have a good time and we're going to have some fun, dude. I'm, I'm really, it, it's really great to meet you and you being from Miami, like I said, it's, uh, it's great, man. It's perfect for wealth on the beach and we're going to share your story and, and talk about uh, how you're changing lives and how you're doing some big things right now. And so, um, so we have uh, on wealth, welcome to wealth on the wealth. Well, welcome to wealth on the beach podcast. My name is Daniel Lonzo. It's always, I'm bringing you the greatest minds in the world. This is our, I think, number 210 podcasts so far. So I'm so excited. Uh, we're, we're talking money, business, health, and wealth. Um, and we have Jeff Seconder. Um, and uh, he's a seasoned cryptocurrency hedge fund manager who is passionate about helping investors invest confidently into blockchain technology and cryptocurrency. Uh, Boren Capital Digital Large Cap Cryptocurrency Investment Fund. He and his partners have created triple digit returns and consistently outpaced Bitcoin. Uh, Jeff also leads a private inner circle mastermind and helps educate over a thousand investors on how to navigate through the crypto markets, which is, is so important these days because, um, you know, there's no question, um, you know, the, the, the crypto market is exploding um, it's a little bit troubled waters right now, and we're going to talk about that. Uh, but, uh, but I think you got started in 2013. So you got to tell us, man, I mean, how rich are you really? Because come on, 2013, you're buying crypto at, you know, at extremely, you know, low levels, man. So tell us about your starting crypto, man. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, a lot of people hear that and they think I'm on, uh, you know, billionaires row here. I'm not quite there yet. I'll tell you that I did buy Bitcoin in 13. It was like $130. I, I probably bought between 50 and hundred. So it wasn't like I was buying thousands of them, but, um, I sold it in, in 14 and then, uh, I started to heavily get back into cryptocurrency in 2017 because that's when I was actually making like a decent amount of money. Um, and I also, I was able to like comprehend what blockchain and crypto, you know, cryptography was. And then I started to have more conviction in it as an actual asset class. So I didn't hold on to that. I obviously hindsight, I wish I would have, but, uh, that's everyone's in that same boat. Um, but yeah, now it's, it's just really, really cool to see the industry and sector grow to what it is today, because I remember talking to financial advisors and professors and all that stuff about Bitcoin back then. And it was honestly just a big joke and only used for fraudulent activity. And now it's crazy to see public companies putting on their balance sheet. And it's uh, been a really, really cool journey to be on. And, and so in 2013, like, why did you start buying it? I mean, you know, like what was the appeal to you personally why did you think this was something that could potentially, uh, you know, be valuable? Yeah, so pretty much the only reason why you would be buying Bitcoin before 2013 is either you're an absolute, you know, geek nerd that geeks out over really, you know, cool things that are on the internet, or um, you're, you're using it for like nefarious purposes on like black markets. Um, I was, that was in 2012 was when I graduated high school. 2013 was my first freshman year in college. So I don't know if you heard about like the black markets on like Silk Road specifically, but that was like a super hot topic in college, at least where I was at. And, and it, like, especially inside of like different fraternities and things. Um, so I just heard people talking about this internet money and I'm like, okay, what is this? And I looked into Bitcoin and then I just bought some, just to buy some. And then, uh, you know, got rid of it and, and then over the next year. So it was really more on, on uh, the side of, hey, you can use it on different mar marketplaces online to buy pretty much whatever the heck you want to buy. And if you look at, you know, the history of a lot of technologies that have uh, come out, you know, a lot of the times that's typically how they start is on a, you know, a way to, to just make markets more efficient or to get, a, get around certain laws or regulations and then as like that, you know, that develops, right, it then becomes more accessible um, and, uh, and you would say acceptable to, to actually use in real, real business and with real consumers. So 
um, yeah, that, that's, that's originally why. And then again, and, and I went into the corporate world. So I got my finance degree in college, went to work for the biggest bank inside the United States in asset management. And then that was when uh, Bitcoin was, you know, started at 1100 and went to 20 grand in a matter of, you know, I think it was within nine months um, in 17 and then went into a big bear market in 18. And that's when I ended up leaving the firm in 18 and started full time um, running our funds in 2019. And so you started a crypto fund. So what was that like? I mean, starting that, I mean, was it hard to do something like that? Was it, do you have a lot of partners? Do you have a lot of employees? What does your company look like? You know, what's, what's, how is it staffed? Yeah. The really cool thing about funds are they are traditionally very, very um, lean businesses. So you actually need, and you don't really want a ton of decision makers because you want to have very clear thought process with investment decisions, but you totally need supporting admins, accountants, lawyers, um, and, and supporting employees to make sure like inve invest relations and investors are getting onboarded and stuff. So yeah, I do have a few partners, but it's a really unique business model and you could pretty much do anything with funds. A lot of people only think of like hedge funds as like trading online. I mean, you could start any type, you could start a, a fund that revolves around, you know, podcasts and getting people advertising on podcasts. Like there's an unlimited amount of things you can do with funds, but it was definitely a confusing process for me. Cause I had no idea. Um, I didn't know anyone that started a fund. I didn't have a mentor to go to, to help start a fund. It was just an idea. Like it was something that myself and one other partner were naturally gravitating towards every day. And we're like, hey, if we're talking about cryptocurrency every single day and spending a lot of time, why don't we just start a fund and we can put our own money together? So that's actually originally what we said. It was, let's just start a, a model where we can put our own money together, manage it together. And then we're like, hey, if we do well, then we'll start to raise money for this fund. So we started the fund and we just managed our own money um, from April 30th of 2019 through the end of 2019. And then we started to raise money in 2021 because we had like a proven track record and uh, and all that. So that's how it actually originally started with just a vehicle for us to put money uh, together. And then it evolved into a pretty large business now. Well, I, I think that's really interesting. I think that's great that that you were able to do something like that. And I just I wanted to make sure just as a real quick side note to everybody listening or watching, uh, I, I have an investment. I'm an investment representative. So uh, I have a few licenses in, in the investment business. And so I just want to make sure everybody's clear. I'm not selling you Bitcoin. I'm not trying to sell you Bitcoin. This is for information, educational, kind of entertainment purposes only. So just be clear on that. Everything we talk about is just a, a conversation. And, and of course, you know, get with your own uh, you know, finance team or, you know, finance professionals to uh, guide you in your own particular situation. And so, but uh, so, so how are you raised, man? I mean, I, I, we're, we're going to get into the, the, the deep stuff in, in a minute, but um, how are you raised? What did your parents do for a living, man? Yeah. So I was born in Pittsburgh, moved to Louisville, Kentucky for a few years. And then my parents, my dad actually ended up starting a business when I was about five years old. So he moved us to Columbus, Ohio, um, to partner with another uh, female on an energy business. So like my grandparents were like blue collar workers, my parents then went white collar. And then my dad started entrepreneurship when I was like seven years old. So pretty much since I can remember, I mean, obviously, there's a few years um, that I remember when he was still in his job. But Pretty much growing up, I mean, he was always, you know, building his business. And then my mom later started an interior design business as well. So I grew up in a family of entrepreneurs. And I, you know, once I got out of the, the phase of uh, wanting to be a superhero, I always wanted to get into finance. So, uh, and the reason is because when I was uh, young, my parents got, uh, so after we moved to Columbus, Ohio, we then built, you know, a house in a neighborhood. Then they ended up getting divorced and then 2008 happened. So I went from living in like a really secure, um, you know, family in a nice house to moving into a much smaller apartment with my dad and a much smaller house with my mom. Um, I went through that whole, you know, recession in 08. And that obviously affected their businesses pretty significantly. So I put a really strong, I, I think I naturally put an emphasis on and relating like stress and security 
um, or stress to a lack of money and security to having money. So I always knew that I wanted to have money. And I felt like that was something that I saw, like what money brought us and then what it didn't bring us. So after I got out of that superhero, like, you know, kid phase of I want to be Superman, I wanted to then get into finance because I asked this, this other gentleman that was pretty successful, or at least it, I perceived him as being successful. And he was a financial advisor. So I'm like, well, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go into college, get my finance degree and go be a financial advisor because I want to be close to the money and always have that like security and be able to like raise, you know, a family in a low stress stress uh, house and environment. And um, that's what I, that's what ultimately why I went through college and then worked for the, you know, the bank inside the United States. And then um, once I got there, I realized it just didn't fit my lifestyle. I was not going to shoot podcasts on the beach. I'll tell you that. So uh, I ended up uh, leaving there and, and because it just didn't align with my values, super great company. I mean, probably one of the, uh, probably the greatest company I'll ever work for. Um, but, but it was, uh, yeah, it just didn't align with my values. So I knew that I wanted to do something that had uncapped earning potential. I wanted to be able to have a freedom of where I spend my time, what clothes I wear, the people I'm around, all those things. And then I also wanted to see impact on people. And I wasn't really, all those three things were not checking the boxes at that job. So I ended, that's ex exactly why I left there and then started, you know, the businesses that I have today. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because you, your story is a little bit similar in the sense that, you know, when I was young, my parents got divorced and, you know, I went and lived in a tiny little apartment with my brother and my mom. And, you know, it's it just, you know, looking back, uh, there was always a part of why I wanted to make money, you know, because, you know, people say shit like, oh, well, you know, money doesn't buy happiness, you know, and that that's a bunch of bullshit. You know, I mean, th there's no there's no like I don't understand why people say stuff like that, because, uh, you know, I, I know what it feels like to not have money. And I'm not saying, you know, I, I'm way happier today with money because the money brings the options. The money gives you the ability to do what you want to do when you want to do it. And, and think about it, the people that you can impact when you have money and your family member calls you up and says, look, I need an operation and it's got to be cash. I mean, you can cut a check and you just save somebody's life. I mean, you can't get more happy than that right i mean you know yeah. when you when you save a life i mean you can't get more happy so I, i'm just saying you know people need to to uh maybe change their thoughts a little bit about the way they perceive money and so i think it's awesome i, I think you saw what could happen when and, and also you saw something in your parents in the fact that they had businesses that are very economy driven. And this is one of the things I try to teach on the podcast. And I just wrote a new book called Wealth on the Beach. And I talk about this, right? I mean, be very, very careful having your businesses in economy driven businesses, because if it's driven only by the economy, it could get wiped out when the economy tanks, right? I mean, you don't, you want to have a business that, and by the way, money and finance and investments, those are pretty solid through any, especially if you're dollar cost averaging and you're buying over long periods of time and you're getting your clients to invest. I mean, they're, they're pretty solid in, in businesses, insurances, solid businesses over long periods of time. So, um, so, so tell me, like, how does inflation impact cryptocurrency? What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, so generally when the dollar gets weaker, um, it's better for, you know, cryptocurrencies and, and, and pr pretty much any asset, right? Because if the, the denominator in the equation is, is devalued, then likely that that price of that is going to go up. Um, but, you know, the difficult part about inflation is, I mean, number one, it's somewhat hard to grasp what it actually is. It's different in every location. And also it's, it's traditionally measured by the CPI, which is a basket of 90 goods and services that they just throw into a, a basket and it includes milk and museum tickets and funerals, which I don't know about you, but I haven't bought any of those in probably a decade. Um, and luckily did not have to buy a funeral, I guess. Um, but it, it, you know, my point is like here in Miami rents went up 40%, right? So, 
but then they're saying inflation is eight percent it's like i don't know it depends obviously on the area but um i think i think the data is really really skewed and the problem is if we don't know what the actual number is um, on an investing standpoint if your returns on whatever investments you're investing in so if the noi of your real estate property if the cash flows of the equity that you're investing in uh, are not exceeding the rate of inflation, then you're likely losing value in that investment. And same thing with cryptocurrency. But the really cool thing about Bitcoin, even after its significant drop from 69K to down 29,000, is it has had an a uh, compounded annual growth rate of over 140%. 140% compounded annual growth rate per year since inception. So it's one of the few assets that you can actually look at. And number one has a decade of history. And number two has a decade of history of significantly outperforming, uh, you know, inflation anywhere between 8, 20, 50, even 100%, right? There's pretty much no other option out there. And the reason why I think it's important as an inflation hedge, and I don't think it's all the way there, by the way, um, which I get this argument a lot, but people don't have perspective. So I'll talk about that here in a second. But it's a disinflationary asset, which means it, it cuts its supply in half every four years. So while it is inflating, it's decreasing the amount that it's inflating every four years by cutting that supply in half. Explain that, because there's a lot of people that like have no idea you know, uh, about what, you know, the, the, the having basically uh, does and why they do that. Can you kind of maybe give us a little more insight on that? Yeah. So the biggest thing is that people need to realize is that investing into cryptocurrencies is not investing into a business. You're not looking for cash flows. You're not looking for the book value. You're not looking for all the traditional things you would look at in investing. You're investing into a protocol and the protocol is essentially a piece of code. And that piece of code makes markets more efficient. So it allows it to store it uh, and transact and also transfer value very seamlessly. So you're pretty much investing in something that has uh, a massive piece of value uh, once it actually gets, once it has adoption, and it's likely to replace a lot of like central agencies and, and even businesses. So you got to realize you're investing into a protocol not a business. So they're completely valued differently. And the halving cycle is just piece of the protocol of Bitcoin. So the inventor of Bitcoin, they wrote the code for Bitcoin and they said, hey, we're going to start Bitcoin out with X amount of supply. We're going to limit Bitcoin to 21 million in supply. And then we're going to let the supply release pretty quickly at the beginning because we want to incentivize people to start mining for the Bitcoin. So they released a lot of Bitcoin in the first 10 years right? Because they needed to incentivize th things called node runners, which is really just mining equipment um, to actually be able to like start mining for the coin. Cause that's those big machines that are mining Bitcoin. Those are the things that are helping verify and validate all the transactions run through the blockchain. So a lot of the supply gets released at the beginning and then it starts to even out over uh, up until 20 year 2140. So every four years, it's just the code that's written for Bitcoin that just cuts the supply that's released in half. So there was 900 Bitcoin released about two years ago per day. Now there's 450 Bitcoin released per day. And then that'll get cut in half to 225 Bitcoin released a day. And then again and again. And, so, and right now we're at 19 million Bitcoin out of 21 million. And the next 2 million of Bitcoin, which is all that's left, is going to get released until a year 2140. So we have like 118 years for the next 2 million of Bitcoin to get released. So there's actually like a really, really low amount of supply that is left over the next 118 years, which is, is, is that pretty why, crazy. So people- Is that why, you know, there's so much of a prediction that it could just, the value could just explode at some point because again, it's, it's a supply and demand issue, right? Yeah, 100%. Yep. It's, it's a very scarce, it's a scarce asset in cyberspace. It's pretty much you're buying, you know, gold in, in uh, the digital version of gold is what a lot of people were related to. And it's taxed as property. So really, it's just like a digital real estate. And it, I do think it, it, it will be a really strong inflation hedge. I mean, it already is traditionally over long periods of time. 
but then people, you know, look at it as a store of value and you got to realize that Bitcoin is still a teenager. It's, it's 13 years old. Okay. So what do, how do teenagers and infants operate? right? Like as humans, right? They, they have really crazy emotion swings, right? They can be super happy one minute, being crying and screaming the next minute. And that's exactly how Bitcoin and these early stage assets are because the market cap is still so low because we don't have regulatory clarity, which doesn't allow long-term institutional capital to come in. Once that does come in, that'll smooth out the volatility and increase the value of the asset. And then it'll start to be able to be used as a store of value. But you got to have context of where we're at currently and where it's likely to go, given you know the momentum that it has right now. I mean, people are saying that cryptocurrency is so risky and so volatile, and you know it'll never last and it'll never be. But but the one thing that's that's kind of curious, and maybe you can expand on this. But what's kind of curious is that a lot of big financial institutions are starting crypto funds. They're, they're getting their clients involved in crypto. Uh, they're buying crypto. Um, you know, there, there's companies now that are accepting cryptocurrency. And so can you kind of, you know, because again, I mean, people are, that are watching and listening, they're like, I'm not doing it, man. I'm not touching it because it's scary and it's, and it's, and it's, you know, uh, risky. And, you know, so can you talk about that? Yeah, I would say that, um, you know, volatility is not always directly correlated to risk. So you need to realize like, yes, the prices go up and down quite a lot, but that doesn't mean that it's risky. I actually think the inverse of what the average person thinks, or at least the sentiment that I hear um, is like, I actually think it's more risky to not have exposure to the asset class. And the reason is because if you look at historical data, and there's been multiple studies done, one was done by JP Morgan, where if you're in a 60-40 portfolio, 60% equities, 40% bonds, if you put 5% of that portfolio in Bitcoin, you actually doubled the return over the last 10 years. And you also decreased the volatility of the portfolio. So from a portfolio allocation standpoint, if you understand what modern portfolio theory is, it's actually really wise to have at least a percentage of your portfolio in Bitcoin or you know maybe other crypto assets that you believe in. But you need to do your own research and have conviction in what you are actually investing in or else you're going to make emotional decisions when the price goes down. So that's the biggest thing is like, you got to realize from an asset allocator standpoint, it actually makes sense. And it's not just the study that that is proving that. It's also like you said, you don't need to listen to what people say. Look what what the successful people do. I mean, if you look at Ray Dalio, the largest hedge fund manager of all time, if you look at Stanley Drunkenmiller, one of the most successful hedge fund managers of all time, both of them are buying Bitcoin pretty heavily right now. And even Ray Dalio came out like two days ago and said, I have not sold any Bitcoin. So like, and then, you know, all the banks, people that hated on it, if you've seen this with Kevin O'Leary, with uh, Mark Cuban, right? They both openly hated so much on crypto and Bitcoin. And now all 80% of all investment dollars that Mark Cuban is investing is going into crypto assets. And now Kevin O'Leary is putting a huge amount of his attention on one of his companies called WonderFi, which is a, D a DeFi crypto platform that generates yields with stable coins. So, and he's speaking at all the major crypto conferences and talking about how bullish he is and all this stuff. Um, so what I typically see, and same thing with Ray Dalio, same thing with everyone, everyone that was, that is a prominent investor pretty much has at one point said that it's a scam, it's a fraud, it's not good. And then what happens is the momentum keeps going and then they look into it and then they read books and they understand what blockchain is and what cryptography is. And then they, all of a sudden, next thing you know, they're buying it. So I would say, understand like the momentum is here. There's countries using it as an asset, as a currency. There's Harvard, Yale, Brown have it in their endowments, Mass Mutual, KPMG, major you know, um, insurance and accounting firms, Tesla, I mean, MicroStrategy, like PayPal, Square, I, the list goes on and on for major public companies and really important asset allocators. And I'll say this last thing is BlackRock, which has over 10 trillion in assets, which by the way, crypto is like 1.2 trillion. So almost 10 times the size of crypto um is is now opening up um crypto to all of their investors so 
it's, you know, it is, it is definitely well on its way. And those are the signs that you should be looking at is like these really, really successful firms and investors, what are they doing? And then, and then, you know, do your own research on your own to see if it makes sense for you. What is, I mean, okay. So this is where the confusion lies for most people is when they look at the blockchain to try to understand the blockchain or understand like what business is being transacted on the blockchain right now, you know, like, like the like companies like are you know, cryptocurrencies like Ethereum, obviously they're, you know, contracts. And I mean, but are there a lot of business that we don't see that average and ordinary people, we don't see being transacted every day on the blockchain? Can you kind of enlighten us on that a little bit? Yeah, so there, there is, uh, especially on centralized blockchains, um, IBM has a massive blockchain that huge institutions use. I'm talking Walmart, Amazon, like the top e-commerce and tech companies in the world use the IBM blockchain. And, and they use it for all different types of things. And the, the core root of, and I'll list a few, but the core root of a blockchain is just a place to record uh, data, right? So it's pretty much an open accounting book that stores transaction data that's unbiased, it's unhackable, it's done in real time. It just makes everything more efficient. And it also reduces counterparty risk as well if it's done in a decentralized manner, which is what is happening right now. And also, even if we look at outside of IBM, you know, Amazon now, I just spoke to them because we run different servers with different uh, cloud providers and AWS is running their own Ethereum nodes. So like they are literally running nodes on Ethereum to allow, you know, uh, developers to come build on the Ethereum blockchain. So for sure, there are real use cases and primarily it's used for like, you know, uh, keeping records for healthcare. It's used uh, to track uh, different items for logistical reasons, right? Walmart can track a package in a fraction of a second instead of it taking 12 hours for them to figure out where the package is now because of the blockchain. Um, you know, even though you're using it to, to ensure that fish are coming from, you know, natural water reserves as opposed to like man-made ponds are able to track things way more efficiently through the IBM blockchain. Um, and then you've got like a ridiculous amount of these NFTs that have come out that are really just like digital art um, that are all hosted on blockchains. So it's the same thing with like a purse, right? You could you could go buy a fake purse, but do you really want a fake purse? Probably not. You probably want the real deal. It's the same thing with NFTs. You can now buy artwork or you can buy membership NFTs. Gary V, um, I'm sure maybe you, you know of him. I'm sure a lot of your listeners know of him, but he's a huge social me media uh, phenomenon. And he, he just had his VCon last week. And to get into his event, you have to show an NFT that's run on a blockchain and to actually get into his event. So there's real use cases that are happening. And here's the thing I would say is, this is another thing you have to have context about is, you gotta realize the internet bubble exact same way, right? Everything with .com at the end of the name was worth so much money. And guess what happened? It was a really big bubble, it came down and, and now what has happened? Uh, the largest companies in the world are all tech companies that are operating online. So that's what I do believe we're going through now is I think things are relatively overvalued, especially with a lot of these little altcoins. I think majority of them are going to do nothing, by the way. I think a lot of them are stupid. But I do think a, a select few of them are going to do very, very well long term. And uh, we're just starting to see the use cases come out. And probably the primary use case that actually pans out in the next 10 years, we don't even know about right now because... We can't predict the future. It's the same thing with the internet. We would have never guessed how many things could have come from the internet happening. Yeah, I mean, you know, you, you think about to have blockchain technology really, um, you know, it, it's going to take over the world. I mean, this is the, what do they call it? The web 3.0. I mean, we're, we're in this yeah. whole nother world. I mean, I was telling somebody the other day, I said, I mean, literally we're, you know, we're, we're going to be putting on goggles, man, in five or 10 years as a normal thing and going yeah. places. You know, I, mean, I, I actually work out, by the way, a, a lot of people <laughs> don't know this, but I work out in VR. 
So I have a VR boxing, oh, right. I have VR shooting, I have VR, you know, uh, you know, just kind of uh, cardio. And so I literally, I mean, every single week, I at least one or two times every single week, I get into VR and I, um, I sweat like a pig, man. And, and it's awesome, dude. <laughs> I love it, man. I love it. I love the fact that I don't have to go to a gym to get a really good workout. I love the fact that I can, you know, just kind of have my own little workout space. And, and, and again, this is just more and more uh, going to be possible as time goes on. And, and it's things like the blockchain. I mean, look, I, the, the, the use cases are just starting. I mean, I have a, I have a buddy yeah. of mine that he's, he's building a company on, on, you know, DeFi for real estate. So instead of buying a house, you know, and, and it taking, 45 days for the documents to clear, you can clear it in three days or you can clear it in two days on the blockchain because it's uncorruptible. It's completely safe. It's completely, you can't, you know, change information on there. Once it's stamped in the blockchain, it's stamped. That's it. You can't change it. Right. So I, I just, I think that, that we, we don't even know how big this thing is going to get. Uh, and, and I just think, I don't know, I, I think that finally, we all now because of like podcasts like this and YouTube and things, finally, the little guys, right, we all have the information now that is teaching us and educating us so that we can we can be early adopters. Most people didn't get in on the dot com boom and bought Facebook at $3 a share, right? Most people didn't get into that. So maybe now this might be a little bit of a game changer for some of us that say, hey, if Bitcoin's at 29,000, I don't know, I'm not selling you Bitcoin. But if it's going down and we now can look at charts that say kind of give us relative idea of where it maybe could go and where it's at, and maybe we can make better choices to maybe become a little bit of an early adopter before this thing could potentially run wild one day thoughts 100 percent. i say like this all the time which i think this is one of the few times that we've ever seen if not maybe the the only time we've ever seen where retail can actually front run institutions typically it's uh, i mean all the top institutions and and accredited and qualified clients they get the best investments before anyone in retail does and, and now this is kind of flip-flopping, which is really, really cool to see. Like retail has an opportunity to actually front run the institutions because they have a board of advisors. They have to go through regulatory compliance, all that type of stuff, which is a, a really, really big opportunity. And I'll, I'll touch on the last piece that you just mentioned is, is we are at that point. If you look at a lot of, uh, you know, technicals, like such as like the two-year moving average, like Bitcoin just dipped below the two-year moving average, um, like what, like three weeks ago, and uh, that that traditionally only happens for like you know between a, a month and and six months um, into an actual bear market. And then if you look historically, it, there's been a, a ridiculous amount of growth after dipping under that key uh, level. So yeah, I think it's just really important to like look at the history and see where potentially it's a good idea if it fits into your portfolio and your goals and the risk you want you're willing to take and all that stuff but i think it is a really really unique opportunity that we may never see again throughout our lifetimes so you're a young dude man and uh you're doing well you're building something you're making progress i mean what makes you happy dude i mean what what gets you out of bed why are you excited right now yeah, I'm excited for a lot of things. I mean, I have a, a really strong desire to help people get to a point where they have something called financial independence, which is when your your passive income exceeds your expenses so that you can go shoot podcasts on the beaches if you want to. Um, and that doesn't happen unless you take control of your finances. So like everything that I build, pretty much 90% of my waking day is spent trying to move towards that mission. So, you know, we've got a company with over 40 employees, um, the hedge funds, uh, we have over, you know, 200 limited partners now. It's like, 
we, we put a lot of, and all the content that I shoot online is all around finance and things, uh, investing and stuff like that. So I'm really purpose driven on that because um, I felt that, uh, you know, I, I was actually had some issues earlier in my life where I got prescribed opiates. This is something we didn't talk about. Um, and that was, I got injured in football. So I was chasing the best receiver on our team. Okay. I tripped over his legs. I went to fall on the ground and it tore all of the muscles in my, my rib cage. And then that like dried with blood. So for like a month, I, I couldn't even breathe without like pretty strong pain. So I, I was obviously not able to play and didn't go to school for about two weeks because I couldn't walk. So they prescribed me uh, Percocet and that just created a really big problem in my life for the next six years. So unfortunately I had, I drugged that all the way through college and even into my professional career. And I realized that I continued that problem, multiple reasons, but primarily because I was trying to escape my own reality because I didn't have a cool reality. And I realized that I was kind of living on what like everyone else wanted me to do and what I thought society would see as successful and all this stuff. And then I realized that I didn't have a cool reality because I didn't have my finances together. So then I'm like, Hey, let's go figure this out. And then I figured it out for myself. And now I'm like, wow, this provided a massive benefit to myself. And, you know, this is something I want to allow other people to be able to do if they have a desire to do it. So that's what, the, what's, the main what's thing. A couple, what, what, what's a couple of just nuggets, man, like that you figured out about your finances that maybe just that yeah. average person can take with them? Yeah, I mean, the number one thing I think is uh, your credit is your foundation, at least here in the United States. So that's the first thing that I did. I had a 524 credit score and I was living in my dad's basement, right? Uh, completely unhappy, unhealthy and, and, and hopeless, to be honest. And I realized that if I wanted to be able to lease a car and rent an apartment and be able to use debt as a, you know, an investor and be able to travel for free, all those things come along with a good credit score. So I really think that's the first area that people should focus. And no matter where you're at, you can clean it up because I had derogatories, I had late payments, I had 100% utilization. I have been in a place where I had terrible, terrible credit. So that would be the number one thing. And then the second thing I would say is like, you got to figure out how to make way more money. I think, you know, important, if you're in a nice, I always talk about this analogy, if you're in a nice car, Okay. And you want to go fast. Um, when you slam on the gas, guess what it does? It actually downshifts the gears. So if you're in gear four, it'll put it into gear two and then it'll ramp up the RPMs and then it will shift past three, four, five. So the first thing maybe to do is, Hey, let's focus on your credit, but let's also look at all the unnecessary expenses that we have in our lives and let's clear all that out. And then let's reallocate that money into education, into networks, into a business, into investments, things that are going to continually pay you into the future. And if you can start to really sacrifice your, your present situation for your future self and the future life and the goals that you have, you're much, much more likely to have um, really great success. And I've been doing this for over four years now, which isn't even that long, I know. But I'm a kind of a, I'm a crazy guy. I put 100% focus in, in one area. And now it's been really cool to see, you know, my life change because, you know, now we, we employ more than 40 people. Okay. And those 40 people feed all their families and all the content that I produce and the thousands of clients that we've had and the, you know, over 200 investors that we have, like all of that has a massive ripple effect. And I'm also seeing it in my family. You mentioned earlier, the wealth thing. I mean, my dog was going to die um, that I grew up with um, two months ago. No one in my family could go pay for, this is uh, thousands and thousands of dollars of a surgery. So what do I do? I paid for it. We got like 10 pounds of tumors removed out of her. And then guess what I did after that? I then, my mom was up in Columbus, Ohio. She um, has been up there for five years trying to get out of her job, trying to get into, move to a different area. So I moved, I bought a condo that's literally right behind me. And I moved her and my dog into the condo. And then I just flew out my sister and now my, my niece, and they're all up there right now, like having a good time and enjoying themselves. So um, it's much while more you're than working your ass to, off you know, while you're working your exactly. ass off on wealth on the beach here today, man. So you're yeah. doing a great job, Jeff. I mean, you should be very, Appreciate very proud it. of yourself, man. Young stud, 
just winning, man, just going, going, going and trying to change your family tree, man. And that, that's, you, you remind me a lot of myself, man. I mean, I'm a lot older than you. Uh, I just turned 83. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but <laughs> yeah, I, right. I, I, I just, uh, no, but seriously, man, I mean, you, you exhibit that, you know, that something, right? Like I'm, I'm, I have, we have a financial services organization. We have 1500 licensed agents, 50 locations. And I'm always wow. telling our agents, like, like you, you gotta, you gotta have something inside and you need to look for those people that have something inside. That's why I like bringing on really super, you know, motivated people. I mean, you don't have to be, you don't have to have a billion dollars uh, to, to, to come on the wealth on the beach club, you know, podcast, but, but you need to, you need to exhibit that that's something that says, man, I'm willing to go pay the price. I'm willing to do that extra amount of work that it's going to take. I mean, you know, it, it's doing it and then a little bit more, right? It's doing what you need to do. It's being a person of your word. It's, it's getting after it day in and day out until the job gets done. Whatever that job is, right? Everybody has different goals. And so whatever that goal is, it's fighting towards that goal, achieving that goal, and then setting some bigger ones if you want to. And if you don't want to, then you just enjoy life and you create a bunch of streams of income and, and, you, and you live like you want to live and, and you be who you want to be. And, and I just I, I think it's, it's fun to have people like you on that, that, that really are, are doing some big things, man. And, and so, hey, look, um, I, I just, you know, as we kind of close this out here, uh, Jeff, um, I, I, you know, I'm sure there's some people out there. They're like, Hey, what's his Instagram? And does he have a YouTube channel? Like what's his website or whatever. So give us all that information. So we kind of can get to know you. And I'm sure people are going to reach out to you and they're going to go, Hey, I saw you on wealth on the beach podcast with Daniel Alonzo. And they're going to throw you a big shout out and, and, and say great things about you. So what do you got for us, Jeff? Yeah, I appreciate it. So, yeah, I mean, all my social media, I'm on, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, at Jeff Seconder. Also, jeffsecondr.com is, you know, I post some things on there, blog posts, recent videos, stuff like that. And then if you do want, you know, if you're an accredited investor and you also, or, or you're not an accredited investor and you want to like start learning about uh, the crypto space, you could text uh, the word crypto to 877-771-0615. And so that's going to give us the information, how we can kind of connect with you. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. Yeah. If you want to streamline, like if you actually have a desire to start learning about crypto or you're an accredited investor and you don't want to have to worry about, you know, allocating all the, the funds into the, the crypto um, asset class yourself, that's exactly what we do, right? We run funds for accredited investors and then we run um, some really, really unique programs with thousands of, of other investors in it that we only teach about asset allocation in uh, blockchain and, and cryptocurrency. So, uh, and, and what was that? To, uh, you, you text crypto to what was that number again? Yeah, it was uh, 877 771 uh -huh. 0615. All right, awesome. All right, everybody, you know what to do, man. You want to know more about this stuff. And again, you know, don't, don't ever invest any money that you can't lose, you know? Because if Bitcoin, I don't, I don't think it's very likely, but if Bitcoin goes to zero for whatever reason, uh, I'll feel just fine that, you know, that, uh, that I didn't lose my family, I didn't lose my house, I didn't lose my dog, you know, and it's like a country song or anything like that. I mean, I, like literally... <laughs> I only have money that I can lose and uh, and I have assessed my situations to say, hey, this, this makes sense for me and my particular situation. But the most important thing I think, and, and Jeff would second this, is that you gotta get educated. You gotta know what, don't ever invest in something you don't understand. So get the education. If you wanna know more about crypto, then text him, it's free, the text is free. The information, you guys are going to give away a lot of information for free, I'm sure. So it's free information. So just get the information, get the knowledge. And if you feel it's right, 
Then you take it to the next step, but don't ever invest in anything you don't understand or anything that you can't lose, especially something that's speculative because it is a, an investment that's still, you know, in its infancy stage, right? And if you're, if you're looking to get rich tomorrow, I remember, I remember somebody told me one time, man, can you tell me how I can make $10,000 tomorrow? You know, and I'm like, well, you know, come on. It's just, you know, that, that's not how investing works, right? This is a long-term game. And, uh, and I just think that with any investment, you should have a long-term outlook, um, especially if it's your retirement or it's your future. And, uh, and of course, asset allocation is just really, really important uh, that, uh, that you are reminded of. So um, with that said, Jeff, Man, I appreciate you coming on um, uh, Wealth on the Beach podcast. We love that we got to hang out with you. Thank you so much for your information, your knowledge, and uh, and your guidance and, uh, and and your story. So with that said, everybody, go reach out to Jeff today. And as always, make sure that you continue to dream bigger. Uh, get after it, man. You, you know you got to get after it. You can't play around. This is, you got one life to live. You can't play around with your life get after it, but most importantly, do it now. God bless you. We will see you at the top.